Hello and welcome to Financial Aid 101. My name is Gail Robertson and I am Director of Admissions for Houston Recruitment for Trinity University, which is located in sunny San Antonio. And today we are going to be talking a little bit more about financial aid and how to finance your college education. So let's go ahead and get started. So a basic definition, first of all, of how to finance uh, your, your college education is that really we're looking at three different components as part of a financial aid package. We typically are going to be looking at merit-based scholarships, we will be looking at need-based scholarships or need-based assistance, and we are also looking at student and family contribution, which is the family's investment into the student's education. Let's go ahead and get started with the merit-based scholarships. So the purpose, the institutional purpose of having merit-based scholarships is that it allows colleges and universities to attract strong applicants to its particular school. So we might be looking and defining that strength within either an academic profile with a GPA or perhaps a test score or perhaps leadership. We also may be looking at attracting stronger applicants athletically or perhaps within fine arts as well. So merit-based scholarships, while typically are thought of and defined a bit more within academic parameters, can indeed include the talent-based opportunities as well. When we are looking at the merit-based aid, we do see that schools will, will um, vary school to school as far as the type of aid and also the amount of aid that might be available. Uh, most ma major or most of the larger merit-based scholarships may be pretty competitive and might be limited to a small number of students, but most institutions will offer some type of merit-based aid. Um, sometimes students may be automatically considered for merit-based aid by utilizing their admission application. Other times students need to be mindful about particular deadlines or maybe even a separate process for merit-based scholarships. So we do want to be attentive to each school's recommendations and requirements for merit aid. A few questions as, an, as, a, as a family that you will want to ask of the institution when considering different merit-based programs, both on the application but also on accepting merit-based aid. Uh, we probably want to inquire what the general profile of recipients looks like. This gives you an indication as to whether you might be competitive for an award or not. What is that average SAT or ACT? What is the average GPA or the uh, type of coursework that a student may be completing? How many different awards are being awarded within that particular context as well? Are, is the school offering five a year or is the school offering the award to anyone who meets the minimum criteria. What are the specific requirements for the award? We want to make sure that we are looking into the citizenship requirements if there are any, or a state of residency, which you may encounter at, at some of your public institutions. We want to make sure that we're looking at the application requirements. There may be a different deadline in which we need to meet. Um, there may be a different procedure. Maybe that requires a different essay or even an interview at that point. And so obviously being mindful of those. We want to know what the actual amount of scholarships will be. Will that scholarship increase as the student progresses through their college experience or will that, that scholarship stay the same? Uh, also, what is the rene renewability criteria? Is it something that a student must maintain a particular GPA or are they needing to reapply for that scholarship every year? All good things to look into before we accept some of those awards. When we start looking at the athletic scholarships, these are actually governed by and overseen uh, by the NCAA. And so schools that are either division one or division two institutions may award students based on athletic talent. Division three institutions and most of your Ivy League institutions will not offer awards based on athletic talent or participation. Most of the recruited athletes for Division I institutions have really been scouted and identified by their junior year. And so if it is your goal to uh, play sport at a Division I institution and you have not already been in contact with coaches, you may want to reach out to do so. 
when you are looking at athletic scholarships as well, as well, please know that you need to see the letter of intent. A verbal promise or a verbal conversation about potential athletic scholarship is not the same as an, a letter of intent or an actual offer. So do be mindful of having it in writing. You will also encounter outside scholarships, which are a great way to help supplement some of the merit-based awards as well. Many times with outside scholarships, you will actually see that that, will, that is funding that you can take with you to any institution that you might be attending rather than for one particular school. Sometimes these might be relatively small or they might be awarded just for a particular year, but I do want to, to make sure that you know that these are typically stackable and they are indeed um, going to add up. And so any, any particular amount does work. Make sure that you are looking at local opportunities. Um, if you are a Houston area student, the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo is a great organization that does indeed disperse um, a, a lot of scholarship um, dollars to our, our local students. Make sure you're searching by major, by interests, by talent. Um, there are scholarships that are a very, um, very determined for a small number of students, and then there are scholarships that a large number of students may be eligible for. And so we do indeed may, want to make sure that we are hitting, hitting any scholarships that uh, might actually apply to you. Make sure you're looking at neighborhoods, churches, synagogues, temples, uh, community organizations, parents, employers. All of these may be great resources to look into when looking at some of the scholarships as well. I will say that when we're looking locally or when we are looking at the smaller scholarships, sometimes they, they might be a little bit less exciting because they don't have additional commas in the dollar amount. But I will say that typically those smaller dollar amounts tend to have fewer uh, students applying. So there's less competition for the awards as well. So keep that in mind when you're applying for outside scholarships. And I will have some resources of websites that I will leave up um, on the presentation a little bit later as to where you might find some of these. Let's go ahead and start veering into need-based aid. Need-based aid is going to be a um, really what we typically would consider more of that financial aid in the, in the true sense. It is largely determined by a family's income and assets and the amount that they might be able to contribute to a student's education. Many of the most selective schools, um, so those top liberal arts schools, the Ivy Leagues, may only fund demonstrated need and not necessarily offer the merit-based scholarships. So this will be the bulk of some of those opportunities that may be available. When determining need-based aid, you will find institutions uh, typically use one or two different forms. The most likely that you will encounter is the FAFSA, which is the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, and that is going to be a form that every institution that distributes federal funding will be utilizing. So this will be a, a, a huge resource for you. The other form that you may encounter is the CSS profile, and the CSS profile is typically utilized by institutions that do distribute a large amount of institutional aid, and so it is an additional form that they may be use, using in order to distribute a, a bit differently. When we are looking at an estimated family contribution, and you will hear me use the word EFC uh, multiple times, we are typically looking at a couple of main criteria. We are looking at student and parent income and assets as those primary determinants, but there are other factors that come into calculating this EFC. Family size, for instance, the number of students in college at the same time, the age of the older parent in proximity to retirement, and that talks a little bit about earning potential there. Those are all other large factors. When using the FAFSA, we do use prior prior year data, which means if you are entering college in 2021, you will be using your 2019 tax return. And this allows us to start that process of application a little bit earlier. That form will open up October 1st of your senior year. The CSS profile will ask similar information to the FAFSA, but it is typically a bit more detailed. It will look at a three-year cycle rather than a one-year cycle, and it does allow a family to discuss and uh, talk a little bit more about special circumstances as well. So when we are looking at the 
uh, family contribution, we typically are looking at the overall cost of attendance of an institution. We subtract out that EFC that has been determined by both FAFSA and CSS profile. And that amount is that is left that, that is a leftover is typically considered our demonstrated need. And that is the amount that schools will indeed be intending to help fund and help assist. When we are looking at different types of need-based aid, uh, there are indeed a couple of different types that we will be looking at. There are um, funding types that are considered entitlements, and these are typically federal funding. So the Pell Grant, if a student is qualified for a Pell Grant, and their EFC must be under about $6,500 a year, they would be entitled to receive a Pell Grant regardless of the institution that they will be attending. So that is something that is available to the student and not necessarily distributed by the institution or the school. Students are also entitled to take out a student loan. So they may encounter either subsidized or unsubsidized federal student loans. And typically for the first year, those will max out at about $5,500 a year. In addition to entitlements, which are again, entitlements to the student, um, there are also allotments, and that would be pots of money that are distributed to the institutions, and then the institution actually will distribute that out amongst all of their applicants. This typically will be most of your state grants. It might be at other federal funding. It could also be institutional grants at this point as well. And so the actual institution's money that they are distributing through financial aid, and this may also be through work study, um, a federal work study program as well. There are opportunities to bridge a gap within a financial aid award, and this would also include PLUS loans, which is a parent loan through the federal government, and then there are also private loans um, that would be available to a family if they are wanting to finance either their estimated family contribution or any type of gap that may be in their financial aid award. Let's look into a couple of um, example awards. And so in this particular scenario, we actually are looking at three different institutions. So you will see school A is right here, school B is the second column, and school C is the third column. We are going to see that each of the schools has a different cost of attendance. And let me talk a little bit about what is included in that cost of attendance as well. This is a figure that schools will use that includes all of the charges and expenses that we feel a student would have in a full um, academic year. So this would be tuition and fees. This would be room and board. This would be travel expenses, which will not be billed by the institution, but a student will incur costs with traveling to the campus. And it would also be things like books and supplies, which students typically purchase on their own and would not be directly billed by the institution as well. So for school A, we see that the cost of attendance is $50,000. School B, $35,000, and School C, $60,000. Now the EFC is pretty much the same throughout all three institutions. So when you are filling out the FAFSA, you will see that the EFC that is available on your FAFSA is shared for all institutions regardless of that cost of attendance for the school. So the demonstrated need then for each of these institutions will be determined basically on that cost of attendance um, subtract out the, the estimated family contribution, and then what we have left is the demonstrated need. Now the sample financial aid packages may look a little bit different on each of these particular schools. So for school A, you'll see that we have the loan of $5,500 that I, I alluded to a little bit earlier, but then we also have a merit-based scholarship of $25,000. So when we are looking at the overall cost, and notice that I am still including the loans in this particular cost because they will need to be repaid at some point. So we are looking at a total cost to the family of $25,000. For school B, which is slightly less expensive to begin with, um, we only have a demonstrated need of $5,000. We have the opportunity to take loans of that $5,000, but that does mean that we will then be financing the full cost at $35,000 a year. 
Our third institution, which is the highest sticker price of the three, again, we will see that the demonstrated need is $30,000. We have a loan that is available to us. We have campus employment, which would be available to us. And then we have a merit-based scholarship of $10,000 and an institutional grant of $16,000. So when we subtract out the amount here, we're looking at the cost to the family of $34,000. Again, remember that I am not taking the loan out um, as part of the financial aid because that will indeed be something that the, the student or the family needs to pull, pay back at some point. So within these particular scenarios, we actually see that our first institution, the bottom dollar or the out-of-pocket cost for the family will be a little bit less than the other two, despite the starting cost of the, of the three institutions. Let's look at another sample. So in sample number two, we're actually looking at the same costs of the institution. So the 50,000, 35, and 60,000, but we see a different amount within the EFCs at this point. Let's say that the school B and school C both use the CSS profile. And we have actually learned that there are medical expenses in the family, and there is also other, um, another family member that the family is supporting, even though it is not part of their immediate family. So the EFC for school B and school C is actually less than if we had just used the FAFSA. So again, the FAFSA EFC may have been $15,000, where the EFC for the CSS profile was $10,000. Now the demonstrated need of the three institutions, again, is, is shown below. So with the sample financial aid package for school A, we still see a loan of 5,500, campus employment is not offered, we have a grant of $10,000, and we have a merit-based award of $25,000. So the cost to the family would be 15,000. School B, we have a loan available, we do have campus employment, and we also have a merit-based scholarship award. So the cost to the family, again, would be $15,000. For school C at this point, we actually see that the grant would be $48,000, which does indeed meet the full family's need as well as the $2,000 of campus employment. And so the full financial cost to the family would only be $12,000. And so this would be an example of uh, where the CSS profile can certainly help a family show additional, additional expenses as well. Now, I have a few resources listed here that might be really helpful for you to gain additional information. First of all, the Office of Financial Aid at each of the schools that you, you or your student um, may be interested in, they will be huge resources for you and they will be able to help usher you through the process for that particular institution. Please use those offices. You may also, if you are just getting into the um, uh, really a little bit more of the college search process, you may also want to use the net price calculator at each school's website. It is a federal mandate that if we use federal funding, we must have a net price calculator on our website. And that is that, that searchable term that you can use. You basically plug in information dealing with your, your financial circumstances. You also plug in information academically speaking, and what is then available to you is basically an estimated financial aid award. So that can be a really helpful resource for families who are trying to get a feel for things institution to institution. Other websites that may be quite helpful, fastweb.com, FinAid.org is actually a personal favorite. They do have some financial aid calculators on that particular website that I feel like do a, a great job of, of helping families determine what to expect. Um, CapEx, College for All Texans, and also BigFuture.com. Um, if you do have a bit more of a complicated financial circumstance, you may want to speak to a professional financial advisor. Um, you may also find that the Office of Financial Aid at different institutions are able to offer you advice as well. So any of these would be appropriate resources. As always, I am also happy to be a resource for you if you have some additional questions, either regarding the admissions or the financial aid process. You can see that my email is listed down below, gail.roberson at trinity.edu. 
I hope that this has been a helpful conversation. And um, if you do have additional questions, please feel out. Uh, feel free to reach out and, and use your resources as necessary as well. And happy college searching. <laughs>